Well, my name is Harvey Humphreys, and I was born in Little Rock, Arkansas on May 21st, 1957. Well, my early days of swimming was I was very small and very sick as a child, in and out of the hospital, the illnesses, and uh, my mother was a competitive swimmer. And uh, she knew the swim coach in Little Rock, Arkansas, and she put me on the team when I was seven years old for health reasons. And uh, I swam and I didn't really enjoy it that much, but I did it because I was supposed to. And then I got to be getting close to 12 years old and they said, I said, how long do I have to do this? And she finally said, uh, well, if you still want to take, if you don't want to swim anymore, you swim till you're 12 and then you can quit. So I quit when I was 12, missed it when I was 13, started back when I was 14 and never stopped. And I loved it ever since. Then the way I got into coaching swimming was uh, I started out by teaching swim lessons. Uh, by the time I was about 14 years old, uh, our coach in Little Rock kind of supported the fact that he had a swim team by a swim school that he had. And they were very good at what they did. And, and I, I had some great mentors as far as being a swim instructor. And so by the time I was 15, I was drown proofing babies. And, uh, and we were bringing them in all summer long. We'd have a practice, then we'd drown proof babies after practice till lunch. And uh, then we'd eat. We'd drown proof babies till afternoon practice, then we'd practice in the evening, then we'd go home. So it was a full day. I took that into when I was in college, one of my friends, Phil Stafford, I was swimming for the University of Georgia and uh, found out that they had these summer leagues in Atlanta. And uh, Jack Hare, another guy that was swimming with us at the time, was coaching Rivermont Country Club. Phil Stafford was coaching at the branches. He was my roommate. He introduced me to Jack Hare. Jack Hare needed an assistant at Rivermont Country Club, and that's where my coaching career began. And I was coaching Rivermont in the summers and training with Pete Higgins and living in Atlanta over the summers. And I did that from about 1977 until about 1982. As far as titles and records and stuff that uh, UGA had accomplished while I was fortunate to be on the staff. Well, the per most important record was actually, had nothing to do with swimming, but it was something that I felt was really important. And that was the number of uh, NCAA postgraduate scholarship winners that we had. And to get an NC2A postgraduate scholarship, you had to be one of the top 30 male or one of the top 30 female NCAA athletes in the country and that was all the sports combined and so only 30 people out of Division I athletes, men and Division I athletes, women got the award and it was based on your academic performance, your athletic performance and your leadership in the community. So you can imagine how hard it would be to get this and uh, our first person to get it actually was Virginia Dietrich who was a dynamo swimmer and it was in 1986. And since 1986, going up until now, we have since had 36 NCAA postgraduate scholarship winners. Well, as, as far as what my coaching experience has done for my life, um, it's taught me how important people really are and how every athlete that you coach is a potential story that you're going to have by the time you finish coaching them that's going to impact somebody else's life. And it could just be how they overcame adversity and they may not have ever traveled. Well, I have been doing this for a long time. But during this time, I was, I've coached every animal in the zoo. I've taught swim lessons to babies. I've worked with you know, eight and unders, nine and tens. I've worked with summer league swimmers for a good five or six summers. Well, shoot, we even started a summer program up here and I was working at nights in the summer, getting a big program here at Bishop Park off the ground. And uh, so I would say the reason people stop being motivated is 
everything gets to be the same. And for me, the fact that every year we have, four, every four years we have a new group of people come in, and as soon as you take 25% of a team out and then put 25% of a team in, it's a whole different chemistry, it's a whole different group of people. And I guess every time we had a new team or a team that had, they have to, they have to create a new dynamic that makes them a good team. And in order to do that, there are people who had to take their weaknesses and turn them into strengths and become leaders. There's people that came in and had to become great teammates. And to watch these people go through these changes, it's different every team that comes through, all the personalities. And then I do that with the club kids when they come in, same thing. So as long as people are different, you're not going to coach anybody the same way. You're going to have a general plan. But there's certain things that all you got to do is tell somebody to do something one way and it'll be great. If you tell the person next to them the same way, they're going to go brain dead on you. So you really have to be flexible, and this might be a little bit of the art of coaching too, but know who you're talking to, know what they need to hear, and then tell them what they got to do, but tell it in a way where they want to hear it. We actually, with our age group team right now, we have a, a thing we call a huddle hero. And every night when Adam and I finish working with our senior kids, we decide who the huddle hero is. And that's the person that night that did something that we couldn't believe they did. And it's sort of like all during practice. Well, I'll go, wait a minute, look at, look what Sean's doing over here. I can't believe it. Look at his stroke. Or, he's, or so-and-so's leading a lane for the first team. You know, Sasso, come over here and look at this. And then that's gonna be our huddle hero. And we bring the kids out and we tell them what we saw. And then that person gets to come up with one word that's gonna be a one word cheer. And then we, we all finish every practice where everybody comes in, you count the three and that person has to yell really loud. And it's so fun watching somebody that is so timid yell loud enough where your hair comes up. So I can't wait to see who our huddle hero is gonna to be tomorrow. So I guess that's why it's fun to come in and do this stuff.